then when it comes to sectioning wisdom teeth, we section um, molars in the same way as we'll see in this, in this video here. And so if we've made a good assessment, we can decide, okay, we're going to need to make a little gutter and move some bone around this tooth. It's a little bit mesoangular, and we might consider sectioning, sectioning the tooth in this particular case. I don't like to use a lot of force removing wisdom teeth, a lot of elevating. So if we section teeth, then we can often remove them easily, and then we have less strain off, off the roots are close to the nerve, with less risks if we've done some bit of sectioning rather than using some heavy elevating to elevate teeth like that. And then we, we may have some more difficult uh, teeth to remove, such as a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth, and in this particular case there'll be a bit more bone removal. Um, I like to be reasonably conservative with the bone removal, just to remove enough and then section the tooth into bits. And again, we want to conserve you know, this buccal plate along here. If you take a lot of bone away from here, it's never going to heal back into that area there. Um, and that becomes problematic, um, particularly if we're doing orthognathic surgery, sagittal splits on patients. I've seen where wisdom teeth have been removed. All that bone, when you come to do the sagittal split, all of this bone's disappeared. Very difficult to do the bony split because the bone's been removed. So um, in those particular cases, I like to take the wisdom teeth out myself rather than have the situation where there's too much bone being removed. So that's just a little um, appetizer into, into wisdom tooth removal. But I use those same principles that we saw in those videos when I'm extracting an erupted tooth. And you know, sometimes it might be sensible to remove the crown before and then section the roots to remove it, depending on what the situation is, particularly if we have ankylosed teeth. Um, in older patients, um, normal molars can be ankylosed. If they're a third molar, we may end up extracting the, the uh, maxillary tuberosity with an upper tooth, for example, those sorts of things. So being careful and choosing to, to section teeth on occasions uh, is important. So I just that was my little introduction on molar teeth. Have we got any questions anybody wants to field from the audience regarding extracting teeth? So what I will move on to now is just talk a little bit about, about implants. So um, you often hear people say, oh, you know, implants are, are great. Implants are very easy. We just drill a hole in the bone and then we drill one of these implants in. They all tend to integrate these days and they all tend to have fantastic soft tissue around them regardless of what we start with or not. But that's not true. Um, implant dentistry is quite a difficult field if you want to do it properly. We don't always see ideal cases like that. There may be some uh, bone missing. We may have irregularities of the adjacent teeth. We may have soft tissue issues. And there's a, a myriad of potential you know, pitfalls when doing this. So treatment planning for single teeth implants, really important. Um, we need to know what's going on with the adjacent teeth. Has it got periodontal disease? You know, do they need orthodontics? Are the restorations of the adjacent teeth and the rest of the mouth intact? Do they need other dental work? So we need some sort of control phase. If they've got periodontal disease, then we might decide on a holding phase before we put implants in to make sure that the patient can maintain their periodontal disease or can maintain in a reasonably healthy state before we go putting implants in. And then we look at, is there some reconstruction needed? And then after the implant surgery, there's a maintenance phase. And what I'm seeing now after being in town putting implants in for over 20 years now, it's very variable, the maintenance phase. So, you know, if you have the patient within your practice and you can control everything, that's great. Where you're a referral practice like me, I put the implants in and send them back to the practitioner and then um, we don't know what happens to that. And, you know, these patients need maintenance. They need scaling and they need cleaning. And the, the patients, if they've got bridge work, they need to floss under the bridge work. They need to use the little pixter brushes under the bridge work. And I quite often see, you know, six, ten years later, patients <coughs> referred back to me saying, oh, you know, those implants you put in Brent, now they've got, you know, bone loss for half the threads down there. And what are you going to do about it? You know, well, there's been, and then you question the patient, how do you clean this? Oh, I use my toothbrush, I clean every day around that with my toothbrush. Have you ever used dental floss under there? No. Did anyone tell you? No. Have you used a pixel brush under there? No. So maintenance around implants is one of the biggest problems in, 
in implant dentistry. And you know, if you've got hygienists and stuff, well then you get these patients back and have your hygienists trained up in how to maintain implants. Because that's one of the reasons implants are failing. That's one of the reasons we're seeing you know, disease around implants is purely maintenance. And when, you, and when you question the patient, you'll find there's been a huge lack of maintenance. So control phase, what does that mean? So we want to have free of pain, infection, inflammation. We want to clean up other areas of the mouth. We just don't want to have a look at a missing tooth in isolation and go, man, that's got good bone, good gum, bang that in there, and we're going to be fine. Um, preservation of the dentition. So we need to make some sort of decision on are, are their teeth need to be removed? Are they, are they restorable? You know, and what does the patient need? and how can we you know, explain to them and go through a phase of that. So, and we, you know, if we've lost tissue, so when you extract a tooth, you're gonna lose the bone around the tooth. So there's a certain amount of bone resorption that's gonna occur very rapidly in three months, slows down over six months, but for the life of the loss of that tooth, we're gonna lose bone and with that goes <coughs> loss of soft tissue. And again, we need to assess those structures and I'll say a bit more of that about later. And then a prevention of breakdowns. We need some maintenance phase so we know that the treatment that we've done is gonna be fine, but the treatment they've had in the past, they can maintain that as well. So we need a global assessment of the patient so we want to look at occlusal stability and see these cases as, you see these cases where they've got significant over eruption of teeth. So they need this sort of stuff managed. What can we do with this? Is it going to be okay? So when we put implants in, you know, for a standard abutment, we need about seven millimeters of interridge space. And if we're using some of the other systems, five millimeters. But if we don't have enough interarch space, we can't put implants into those sites. So are those teeth going to be salvageable? Can we root fill them? Can we crown them to shorten that? Can we use orthodontics to intrude them? And so there's a number of ways of managing over-erupted teeth like that. But we don't want to just put implants in and leave the rest of the dentition looking like this. And obviously, you know, finances come into that as well. So we see patients who can't afford all the treatment that we would prescribe for them, but we can then have some sort of plan for them over time where we can manage some of these issues for them. Um, are there other issues? Do they have temporomandibular joint problems? Do they have parafunctional problems? So when you look in here, this is significant loss of tooth structure here. And if they've got, um, you know, parafunctional habits, if they're breaking down their natural dentition, they're gonna break down your crowns and they're gonna break down your implants and overload your implants. So management of these parafunctional habits is really important when we're doing implant dentistry. Again, I've already mentioned about periodontal disease, so we need to manage this. You know, and, and I do see cases where you have implants put into uncontrolled periodontal mouths and you know, that's just not appropriate treatment. And so we need to get these, these uh, phases under control. Um, sending people for periodontal disease, uh, management to a specialist or managing that yourself also puts them in a phase where you can assess them to see what whether they can maintain things. And so you'll get a very good idea if they're compliant with their periodontal management, then you can be sure or more confident they're gonna be compliant with other treatments that you will do. Um, significant attachment loss is a problem. Um, biotype's important. If we have a very thin biotype, when we extract a tooth, we're going to expect more uh, gingival recession. And so we need to plan this into our treatment. So if we've got a thin biotype and we're going to replace a tooth, then maybe we might consider having a connective tissue graft in those particular cases. If we've got a thick biotype, we're probably not going to need to do that. So tooth straight status. So we need to and, and have some sort of time frame that you feel comfortable with. And maybe that's five years, maybe it's less, or maybe it's more in terms of how you see adjacent teeth are going to hold up. And if we have two root filled in sizes and one's failing, we might choose to extract one and put a single tooth Im implant in here. Less predictable if we do two implants together. So if we can maintain the health of one incisor and place implants at different time phases, that's going to help us m to maintain that interradicular bone in that area and have less problems with gingival shrinkage uh, and uh, loss of interdental papillae and those sorts of problems as well. So local assessment is important. So we've got a global assessment, then we're going to look locally 
and make a decision. So we want to have a look at, you know, what is the occlusion like? What are their contacts like? You know, if we're going to place implants in there, have we got, you know, eccentric contacts that may complicate our treatment? So some sort of assessment of the occlusion uh, is important. So, and then we have soft tissue, so we have a visual treatment objective. And again, if we've got some gingival problems before we extract a tooth, and we can see here, in this particular case, we've got good gingival health here, not such good gingival health here. If we've got swollen gingivae, or if we've had a history of infection there, the, the labial bone over our incisor teeth is extremely thin. If we have infection, any kind of infection, we lose bone very, very quickly. So whenever I see those sorts of problems, I assume they've got bone loss. So when I'm extracting that tooth, I've already explained to the patient they're going to need some sort of augmentation. You need about two millimetres of labial bone thickness over an implant to prevent getting gingival recession and bone resorption. If it's less than that, then we need to make some decision about what kind of augmentation or how we're going to manage manage that. And these days we extract teeth and we put implants in immediately in selected cases. So we need to have a good assessment of all those things. So if we're going to put an immediate implant in, we want to have labial bone present. We don't want to do that if all the labial bone's already gone. We don't want to do that if, if we've got frank sepsis. If we've got a little bit of granulation tissue that can be thoroughly corrected and the, and the socket debrided appropriately, then we can consider putting immediate implants in. Those sorts of things. So the treatment planning that I'm going through or what I'm explaining to patients what is possible. For some people I'll say, I think we might be able to put an immediate implant in here. Other cases I'll say, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. We're going to have to correct this, sort the infection. We're going to have to put some bone in there, restore some of the soft tissue before we can do that. So it might be, you know, a one operation for the patient, or it might be two or three operations for the patient um, spread over six months or eight months. And so I need to convey that sort of thing um, to the patients. And, you know, and your patients come in and I'll tell them you need this, this and this and it's going to take about seven months and they go, oh yeah, but I saw on TV or I saw some advertising and someone said they can take my tooth out, put one in and, and I'll leave with a new tooth in, you know. And I'll say, well, yeah, sure, we do that on some occasions, but, you know, in your particular case, you're not suitable for that. So patients... Um, we'll see advertising, patients will use the internet, and sometimes that's relevant and helpful, and other times it's not relevant and it's unhelpful. So they will come in with questions and asking you, and we've got to have good answers for them and not promise them things that we can't deliver. So distance is important as well, and quite often you see cases where people have had orthodontic treatment and they might have orthodontic treatment when they're 14 and maybe they're missing a lateral incisor, for example, and they go into a retainer, but by the time we see them for an implant when they've stopped growing, those um, tooth roots have converged into the space. And so, you know, this is opening up a space. Um, so teeth need to be bonded. Uh, in that particular case because the, if you've got a partial denture and then what happens that partial denture is going to maintain the space at the crest of the ridge but it's not going to maintain the root angulation and so quite often people are having a second course of orthodontic treatment to open space um, for, for implants. Um, so thinking globally and treating globally is optimal, thinking globally and treating locally is compromise and then thinking locally and treating locally, locally potentially incompetent as well. So we really need to get a good handle on what we do and you know, assessment, treatment planning, the same things we talked about with removing teeth is the same things we need for that. Medical history, and so this is a good paper by Glenn uh, on medical history related to uh, single tooth implants. So when we're looking at at surgery, so there's patient related factors. So is the patient suitable for local anesthesia? You know, have they got medical issues that might require them to be done in hospital? Do they have bleeding disorders? Do they take aspirin? Do they take other anticoagulants? And there's a number of things that people get uh, from the chemist that, that, that cause bleeding as well. So garlic, ginger, ginkgo, St John's wort and fish oil all contribute to bleeding. So I always ask my patients now if there are any of those things because people just assume that they're over-the-counter things and they don't affect anything, but people can have quite significant bleeding and bruising problems when they're taking those kind of things, particularly fish oil. And I advise them to stop taking those things at least a week before any surgery. Um, Component-related factors. So we need to 
understand what components we're going to use when we're placing an implant. What implant system are we going to choose? Is that implant system appropriate for an aesthetic zone, for example? Are we using the right connection? Are we familiar with the components? So I think it's a big thing if, you, if you're doing surgery on someone and you're using a system, you need to understand that system. So before we go to surgery, you need to understand what the drilling protocol is, you need to understand the connections, you know, for placement of these implants, whether, you know, if it's an external hex implant, how, do, what, how does that connect and how do we place that? You know, is it internal connection? How are we going to use that? What depth are we going to place the implant to? So procedural factors, we need to understand those things. You know, and, and, and the general hospitals now, you see quite often the, the reps are there with the orthopaedic surgeons all the time. And my assessment of that is, is that they don't understand the equipment that they're using fully. And I think that we need to understand the equipment that we're using fully. You need to understand how the drill works. You know, I've seen people come along and they can't work out how the foot pedal works, you know. And are we on 2,000 RPM and how do we change that to, you know, to, to a torque situation if we want, you know, 30 Newton centimetres or 40 Newton centimetres. So people don't even know how to use the drills. And that says to me that you shouldn't be doing that procedure if you don't understand your equipment. So, you know, Nova Bike is pretty good with all the protocols and everything for, for the drilling sequences and equipment use. So medical conditions. So, you know, local factors like bone quality, quantity, um, and then your, your bone trajectory, how much bone it got, is it in the right place? You can have a scan and look at a scan and think, I've got a truckload of bone here to put the implant in. Then you make a clinical assessment and you see that there's a massive labial concavity. So in an anterior situation, there might be a bulk of bone towards the palatal, but that's useless because we can't, if you put that implant into that position, it's gonna be in the wrong position. So clinical assessment and marrying that in, you know, with our other, you know, radiographs and cone beams or CTs or whatever is important. So really the, this line's important here. More significant indicators of outcome than associated with medical conditions. So our local factors and our ability to, proceed, to do the procedures is more important than, uh, there's not many medical conditions that contraindicate us placing implants, for example. So cardiovascular disorders, hypertension. So if you've got a, someone with uncontrolled you know, hypertension, we shouldn't be operating on them for a start. And if you do, they're going to bleed more, obviously. So that, that sort, of, sort of medical things can be, need to be controlled. And there's a lot of people wandering out there with uncontrolled blood pressure. You know, some of them know it and other, others of them don't know it. So again, if we're going to operate on people, maybe we need to, you know, know what their blood pressure is and when they come, I've got run a day hospital, so when they come in I've got registered nurses who are taking their blood pressure and that sort of thing. And if there's a problem, sometimes we'll cancel patients if their blood pressure is not, a, is not in a range that we would consider appropriate and if they've had no treatment for that, we'll send them off to get sorted out. Antibiotic coverage, so if they've got heart valves or they've had endocarditis mm. or other issues, we might consider that. Um, we're going to 